welcome everyone to this launch event of our um, insight paper, of our third insight paper on research-led education in the digital age. My name is Jan Pomowski. I'm the Secretary General of the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities. And I'm very pleased to be joined by a, a, a hugely distinguished panel to talk about uh, some key issues um, about how we imagine, how we can reimagine uh, education um, in really exciting ways um, uh, leading into the next uh, decade or so. Um, we, uh, we've, when the Guild was created, um, we had at our General Assembly um, almost five years ago, um, our presidents who insisted that the Guild could never be just about research, but that education was as central to research to, to, to uh, universities um, as the research that, uh, that informed this education. Uh, and so it was no surprise that when um, our presence reflected individually and together on where Europe, uh, Europe's universities should move in, over the next 10 years, um, what, uh, what vision we might articulate for European universities and for Europe's universities by 2030, they all had a sense that um, the most fund fundamental transformations in universities will happen in the sphere of education. Um, so, and this was, um, we, we had these conversations before the pandemic even uh, started. So the question of how education will change, at what speed it will change, and at what cost? I mean, all these questions are of fundamental importance, uh, and this concerns led to wide discussions in the Guild about research-led education in the dig digital age. And these discussions were led by Professor Joan Guri, who joins me uh, now, and I'm very pleased um, that, she, uh, that we can kick off this event uh, with her and her paper. But this paper was supported by a writing team um, consisting of uh, Arne Falk from the University of Tartu, Vice President there, uh, Vice President Beric I Barrett Eicher from the from Aarhus University uh, and Vice President Karen Amos uh, from uh, the University of Tübingen. But there's also a, um, a very um, uh, large numbers of working groups in our General Assembly and our Vice Presidents who were involved in the conversation. Um, but because this paper is very much a reflection of our own thoughts and our own um, ideas, it was extremely important to us in this launch event um, uh, to, to extend the discussion beyond our network as far as possible. And this is why we really wanted to have uh, to invite a panel that was largely outside uh, our network. And we're delighted that we, we have been joined by such a fantastic um, and distinguished panel. Um, we would really like to hear from the audience. We've already heard uh, some questions from you at the point of registration. Um, and uh, I would uh, please, when you if you have questions, use the Q&A options um, and vote on the questions that you'd like to see answered. Um, note that the materials from this uh, webinar and the recording itself will also be uh, available uh, af uh, at, uh, after this event uh, at our website. And so now, without further ado, I, I would like to give the word to the lead author, Joanne Guri, um, uh, to really discuss uh, some of our key findings on research-led education in the digital age. Jo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. Um, and first, I would like to start by thanking the writing team from my end too. The paper is the product of um, good ongoing collaboration between us uh, and together we have produced what we hope is the start and an opportunity for, for dialogue and debate. So the paper responds to the current emphasis on education by international and national policymakers and the strong discourse of the need for change that is everywhere around us and problematizes what change could and should look like for higher education in the present moment. The paper's aim is to propose a framework and sustained intervention on research land education in the digital age and lead a critical discussion uh, in the sector and within our institutions and offer some possible solutions in line with the current policy context and particularly the 2025 uh, European Education Area and the Digital Education Action Plan. It summarizes its key messages in six areas, uh, which uh, I will share uh, at the end of my short contribution. So what was our starting point? Uh, first, in order to move forward, we need the legacy of the past and an understanding of the current landscape. Uh, in Europe, this directs to the experience we have with Erasmus Plus and the Bologna process, which has provided us a strong foundation to build a new vision and strategy for the sector. 
Polonia has provided the aspiration language frame for European education, uh, priorities towards comparability of degrees, pan-European system of credits, cooperation and quality assurance, as well as invaluable learnings uh, from the challenges we met and we meet on the way in the implementation process. And this is really invaluable because in order to move further, we know that we want to scale up pedagogies and processes that will allow us to achieve the ideals of openness, flexibility, individual choice, equality, and inclusion in higher education. The Academy is currently encouraged to think outside the box. Uh, this needs to be facilitated uh, if we are restricted to our current and past processes and tools, we know that will be hampered by the constraints we have experienced already. We therefore need new systems that provide agility and are built on trust to achieve the vision for the European University of the future. So in our paper, we started mapping some of the core issues uh, we believe we need to address in rethinking our systems and tools, and more broadly, the principles that underpin our pedagogic offering. The issues or clusters of issues that you will see on this slide uh, have been seen as tensions or dichotomies, and the core aspiration of the paper is to go beyond binaries and dichotomies. They can no doubt uh, cancel one another, but instead of looking them as either or, uh, it is useful to use them as learnings of the past and the springboard for where we want to go. Particularly looking into the fine equilibrium that needs to be achieved for standardization to facilitate and not stifle innovation, or the challenges in balancing the vision of a transnational delivery of education, sharing curricula, infrastructure, enabling each other in order to transcend geographical, linguistic and disciplinary boundaries, with the priorities of national legal and regulatory system takes us at the heart of issues we experienced under Bologna and from where we can learn a lot for the policies and tools we need in order to go beyond what we currently have. The European University Initiative is a potential new tool towards this direction, an experiment which seems to be producing good results and which is an opportunity to articulate the value added of transnational collaboration. This experiment will need to be properly supported to move from pilot to implementation or from experiment to mainstream. New tools are also necessary for universities to meet the needs of students uh, and regional and national context. The demographic profile of our students is changing. The, the, the model, the traditional student who can spend three to five years on full-time education, independent means can no longer be considered or will no longer be considered the norm. Universities are prompted by policymakers to engage with industry and the industry 4.0 discourse to diversify our pedagogic offering. This involves establishing alternative credit pathways alongside traditional degrees, balancing disciplinary expertise and subject knowledge with opportunity for interdisciplinarity, embedding active learning across curricula, engaging more fully with lifelong learning. The current discussions on the micro-credentials agenda is a case in point and work that we need to continue. A lot needs to be achieved fast. So up to here, we could have had this conversation in early 2019. Uh, in fact, we did have this conversation in early 2019. The European University Initiative was launched then, created a different model to enable European universities to come together, collaborate, meet goals and aspirations. For instance, the commitment to 50% mobility, student mobility by 2025. And then COVID happened. Uh, and uh, we all became um, digitally enabled, uh, moved online overnight, uh, and this came with uh, various utopian and dystopian scenario, neither of which is a good advisor for the future. The COVID-19 disruption brought a comprehensive need for flexibility in European higher education. Student staff, all of us, uh, became mobile and immobile simultaneously. We had to redefine uh, on and offline operating in a digital space, not by choice. Dominant modalities, our face-to-face -face teaching model has changed and is morphing possibly irreversibly to uh, a hybrid with blended learning uh, becoming the main modus operandi. So we've experienced emergence interventions. Uh, however, emergence interventions are exactly that, short-term responding to an immediate pressure. Uh, they should be distinguished for long-term learning designs. If our aim is to capitalize on the experience we have in the sector with virtual learning environments and 
uh, and generally with the, uh, the technology enhanced delivery of our provision, we have, we have in the sector then the, and use the current disruption to provide a more dynamic learning environment as we should, then we need to revisit our vision for higher education and the principles that will guide the shift from where we are to where we want to be. And the University of the Future Technologies, yet again, are not another binary, it's not an either or, it is embedded from infrastructure to wearable technology to the delivery of our pedagogic offering. But this does not mean on, online, and it does not mean that online is the panacea. If anything, we experienced the importance of the social aspect of learning in the past 14 months, the impact of isolation on well-being, and we have all missed being with our students and colleagues and learning together in face-to-face -face learning environments in the classroom. Future-proof learning designs require a reconceptualization of learning experiences available to our students, going beyond linearities of the past and towards an education model which blends face-to-face -face and digital and empowers the students to apply their learning to global problems, acquiring solid disciplinary education alongside experiencing interdisciplinarity. Future-proof learning designs are active learning designs. This is particularly important for the role of research intensive institutions, which educate the citizens of the future and uh, meet the needs of our future societies as well as the current ones. This has also to have deep implications for pedagogic formats available to the students, core academic practices and models for cross institutional and cross national collaboration. This level of change, however, uh, cannot be delivered uh, without appropriate support. Uh, and support, we can move to the next slide, please. Support uh, in the form uh, of policy tools and a vision for the research led education of the future, but also support in the form of resource and recognition of the time and effort that is required. Uh, resource often remains the elephant in the room when pedagogic innovation is on the table. Education change, I'm sure you've all experienced, we've all observed that, often reliance on agency, contribution and generosity from different parts of our universities, academic staff, administrative and professional services and students who participate in large projects on top of regular workloads. This shows commitment and buy-in, very important, uh, but it's not sustainable and is not comparable to the scale of the ambition of the current policy agendas and is not comparable to the need and opportunity for change. Hence a core issue that we need to address and it is a red thread uh, is the need and opportunity for deep qualitative change while at the same time balancing an institutional level costs associated with digitalization. COVID-19 is a case in point. We also how quickly we can go online with the tools we have but the time and investment that is required in redesigning and really readjusting our pedagogic offering. And at the same time, balancing decreasing budgets per student and staff under a lot of pressure to cover the daily needs uh, of the profession and hence with no capacity for extra work or for strategic redesign of our current offering. This requires top level support uh, for higher education and, and, and for uh, sustaining um, pedagogic innovation and an open discussion uh, on funding models that uh, are necessary and possible. So our vision is for universities to capitalize on the current disruption, uh, to retain all the things we do well and change practices that we can do better or to not serve or will soon not serve the needs of our students and the dynamic societies uh, around us. Universities have solid expertise to build uh, on experience we have in the sector and lead the deep change that is required and possible. Research intensive universities, however, uh, and the higher education is not uh, the sole, are not the sole, universities are not the sole providers of programs and courses, nor should they be. There has been a lot of discussion on what the future of learning and the future university could and should like uh, look like from different providers with different agendas. This is another binary we challenge in our paper. Universities, we don't see universities in competition with ed tech or with commercial providers. Why would we be? Uh, we have different roles and orientation. We need, however, a deep and open dialogue on the best ways to work together in a symbiotic relationship and contribute to the wider ecosystem. So to conclude, we have organized our contribution uh, in six key areas, which include the questions we feel we need to raise and the positions we need to debate. 
We have summarized those uh, in the video that uh, we are going to share now. In March 2020, Europe's universities went 100% digital. Overnight, university education was fundamentally and irreversibly disrupted. So how do we reimagine higher education beyond the pandemic? How can we develop a vision for higher education that strengthens the connection between research and education, developing new and appropriate tools to expand the reach, formats and impact of our research-led pedagogic offering? In the future, change will come in six areas. One, the future is not and must not be all digital. The disruption has highlighted the social importance of learning, the impact of isolation on well-being, the depth of the digital divide and the need for flexibility. We need to think creatively on the balance of blended models. Technology will be embedded in the university of the future, from infrastructure to digitally enhanced lecture theatres to wearable technology. We need to develop new ways, however, to enhance what remains the mainstay of most universities, the social learning experience. Two, research-led universities should lend their distinctive strengths to lifelong learning. Digitalization is among the most powerful forces of societal and economic transformation, requiring more and more people to learn new skills throughout their adult lives. Universities need to strengthen their engagement with lifelong learning and the emphasis on flexible designs. Developing micro-credentials that are recognized across the center and beyond could be an important start. But universities must not compromise on their core mission of educating for active citizenship and long-term societal growth and well-being. Universities must be enabled to respond to this challenge according to their own strengths, notwithstanding the need for harmonization. Three, pedagogic innovation must be accelerated to educate for continuous change and disruption. The sense of urgency to be able to cope with and lead a changing world demands education that encourages students to be curious, active learners. Students need to be open-minded, able to address complex problems. Digital tools, new and established pedagogies are all needed to enable students to explore and apply their learning. However, diversity of needs must be a core part of the learning designs of the future. Universities have the experience and expertise to pave the way if policy, funders and regulators enable them to do so. Four, we must move beyond red tape to develop enabling and flexible regulatory frameworks. Current quality assurance models cause barriers to international collaboration, despite the best intentions of the Bologna process. To be sure, collaboration cannot do without standardization processes which need to provide reassurance. A key challenge for the future, however, lies in how this need for standardization can avoid bureaucratic procedures that are time-consuming and deeply risk-averse. We need quality assurance models that build on trust and enable. Five, we must articulate the added value of international collaboration. We're rediscovering the value of collaboration at the regional, national, European and global levels. Yet rarely is the value proposition explicitly articulated. Collaboration between different types of institutions, subjects and at geographical levels can provide new and unique opportunities for students. But these need to be spelled out to determine what type of collaboration adds value in which circumstance. Six, we must invest in the sustainability of pedagogic innovation. Educational vision and change cannot come without investment. The pandemic put enormous pressure on staff and students and has shown that redesign is both possible and resource intensive. We need a viable and pragmatic model for better recognizing the time and effort spent on education innovation. Universities have always changed with society. What's new is the speed of the digital transformation accelerated through the pandemic and the complexity of global problems. They require universities to strengthen research-led education and their students' global skills and mindsets. What does change look like for your institution? How can universities build on their strengths to embrace transformation in new ways? Join us and be part of the conversation. So 
join us to facilitate the conversation. Today is just the beginning of what we hope uh, is a journey. Uh, we have organized a seminar series um, which will enable us to zoom in on these core issues. More details will be announced formally and properly soon. This is just a little uh, sneak preview for us today. The first seminar is already taking place on the 29th of June on transnational collaboration and lifelong learning. And we're going to discuss the micro-credential uh, agendas. There is a fascinating lineup of contributors. We will announce the details and open registration in the coming week, so keep an eye out. Uh, and this is followed by a second event on the 23rd of September of the core and very important question on building standards that help and not hinder. Uh, more information will be announced on times and dates of the other events, uh, but uh, you already see uh, how much how much is already uh, on the table. So join us to address change in those six areas, to identify a sustainable approach to resourcing pedagogic innovation and use our collective power to bring the change we want to see, our students deserve and our future societies need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe. Jo. That's, that's a fantastic introduction. And uh, with this, um, I want to move to the first panel. Um, because gone are the days when we really think of the EU's added value in the re realm of education as being really essentially and primary and only really about mobility. I mean, that's still important. But the European Union is no longer simply just about establishing the single market. Um, it's very clear that with the European education area, the Commission has really signaled that how we prepare young citizens to benefit from the single market and how we enable um, individuals um, and students to engage in, Europeans, uh, in Europe's digital and green transformations. These are critical policy concerns uh, at the highest level. And in return, the Commission has created a new European space for educational debate. And of course, our initiative seeks to reinforce this. So it really is appropriate uh, at the start of this series of conversations to um, begin our discussion at the European level. Um, so we start our first panel with uh, Vanessa debier saint um, head of unit for uh, higher education uh, at DG EAC, um, and M Michael Gebe, a director for higher education policy at the European University Association, the EUA. So I'd like, like each, each of you maybe to start with some opening reflections before we uh, get into a discussion, but I also want to encourage the audience as you hear the contributions uh, to uh, share your reflections with us and uh, uh, through the Q&A se uh, session, which we'll do our best to answer then in the discussion. Vanessa, beginning with you, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. First, I would like to really congratulate you for this very rich, uh, but also very interesting, uh, excellent report that uh, can inspire a lot of uh, rich discussions, uh, I'm sure. And uh, as you said, uh, Jan, it comes at a very timely moment, as we are indeed as you said, in the co-creation process of uh, creating, co-developing what we have called provisionally um, a European strategy for universities. So as, as you said, we are looking at, at the next 10 years and um, we are in the middle of this European-wide consultation process. We are aiming at presenting such a strategy early uh, 2022. So I would like to share with you some initial ideas gathered through the co-creation process so far, and you will see that it very much links with what you've what you've put in the in the report. The, there is first an overall an overwhelming agreement on the value of such a, a European-wide strategy at this moment. This was confirmed by the ministers responsible for higher education uh, two weeks ago when they met when they met in the council and they had. Uh, a rich debate around uh, such a transformation agenda, if you want. And, uh, and uh, it builds on many of the topics that you have uh, analyzed in this, uh, in this report. The events of the past 15 months have shown us that we are at a transformative moment in higher education, as you have uh, rightly reported. And our objective with such a strategy and, and council conditions that will support this, this strategy is to really support and empower higher education institutions 
in this transformative moment. Now, of course, all the, the issue is what, what are the actions uh, that we can uh, uh, develop together, the right actions that will support you, all of you, in this uh, transformative uh, moment. Because higher education can and must play a leading role in this post-COVID recovery of Europe in making our society greener, fairer, and, and more digital. And in equipping people with the competencies that our fast-changing society needs. And when I say people, it includes not only students, but also life-wide learners and the European workforce in increasing needs to upskill and, and reskill with the support of education training institutions. And as you write in the, in the report, universities should, be, should lend, to, 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 to take your own words, should lend their distinctive strengths to lifelong learning. And what we see is that a lot of higher education institutions, but also private providers are developing short learning courses leading to micro credentials with the objective to provide easier and complementary, that's very important, it's, it's a complement to what you said before is the core part and, and the core mission of your higher education institutions. But it can be a nice complement to make your institutions more accessible to a wider range of, uh, of learners. Um, but what we see at the moment is that there are some uncertainties around what kind of added value we can have these this short learning courses leading to micro credentials simply because there, there is currently a lack of European standards. And this is where we think maybe Europe can add value by defining such European standards to help with, uh, with, with the trust, the recognition, their validation and, and their checkup. So there is an ongoing public consultation that is open to the, to the 13th of July. So I would like to invite all of you to contribute to these uh, public consultations, which really, which will really feed into the, a proposal for a council recommendation that we aim at proposing by the end of this year. Now, a second very important topic that I would like to highlight, it's so rich that I will not be able to cover everything, but uh, I'll just try to, to point out to some of them. The other very important one is that we need high education institutions to be actors of change at this turning point that we are facing today. We are entering a new digital decade. And we want as well universities to be part of the solution for the Green Deal and the new industrial strategy. But when it comes to the digital decade, you rightly point out, point out that there is still some way to go to reach the post-digital university. And my question to you today is what is the EU not doing that you think it could do or should do? There is much potential in hybrid models of teaching and learning in finding the right balance between physical and distance uh, models. And as you say, the future must not be all digital, but how can we find that, that right balance? And what would be useful at your level for you to, to support you and, and to to have high education institutions have the support, the knowledge, the capacity um, to, to harness it. So the Council of Ministers called for high education transformation with a focus on inclusion, innovation, connectivity. I'm sure we'll speak about it, the importance of deeper cooperation, digital and, and green readiness, having in mind the international competitiveness as well as well as the fundamental academic values and highly ethical principles and employment and employability. So you see that the agenda that they have given us is, is quite broad. And there is a strong conviction that the strategy should speak to the 5,000 or more higher education institutions across Europe. And, and related to this point, I would be very interested to hear your views on how we can use the is diversity in our high education sector for all benefit and, and strength. What considerations are necessary for the strategy to be beneficial for all types of higher education institutions from east to west, from north to south, to educate, conduct research, innovate, and serve our society across borders, 
disciplines, languages, and cultures. I will stop here, but as you can see, it's a, it's a very rich uh, discussion that we're going to have. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan and Joe and, and all the others. So it's a really important discussion that doesn't lack ambition, yes. which is appropriate to, to the task at hand. Uh, yes. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Michael. Yes, thank you. And also from my side, thanks for this paper. It's uh, really inspiring and thought provoking. And I agree with Vanessa, it comes at a really good moment. You may have seen the Universities Without Walls uh, Vision 2030 that EUA puts out and you will see um, many things there are, uh, are, are quite similar. This is not that I accuse you of plagiarism, but just to say that it's, it's somehow <laughs> happening everywhere. And uh, we're probably like the uh, five blind men and the elephant, you know, where we approach it from different uh, perspectives and see different things there. So it's really important to talk about this and get our thoughts together. The point that you make here and uh, that Jo uh, illustrated so well in her presentation is why don't we change you know we seem to know some of the goals what we want to be actually you know the open international university but we are not getting there or not as quickly as we want to and uh, in the paper you point out three points one is the institutional conservatism and red tape the second one is national level and the third one is um is probably also Bologna, which uh, is, uh, yeah. And I, I think I just take it up there. If I look at the institutional level and just pick out this one point that you made about research-based uh, education, I don't have to uh, say here that I agree with you yeah, fully. And EUA has made that very clearly on several occasions that we really think it's important that already undergraduate uh, students are exposed to well, if not research, but curiosity-based learning and interdisciplinarity. And uh, you also make the point that there is a bit of uh, diversity, lack of definition of what that actually means in the sector. And I would encourage you to explore that further. I think that could be very, really helpful. We did this on recently. We asked colleagues and we found out they all agreed on research-led education, but they had very different ideas from summer schools, student projects, whatsoever, um, on how that would be done. And from some systems, you also heard a bit, well, is that not more for the master's level or even the PhD level? So I think that's probably a first point here that we get uh, things that have been very intrinsic to the institutions, to disciplines or to individual teachers, that we expolite them more, that we make them more visible and get not an agreement, but it make the diversity and the different ways of understanding them more visible. Related to that, asking myself, what is hampering? What I thought what could come out more clearly is, I mean, you make the point of parity of esteem and the importance of inter incentivizing and recognizing pedagogic excellence. Again, something we have uh, expressed on several occasions. What I wanted to add here is just the point of the academic careers. Yeah, because that really turned out on several surveys that we did as one of the big hurdles. You do not get recognized, you do not get acknowledged for what you do in education. So if we don't tackle that, and if we don't uh, make that really a part of the academic career, um, academically and professionally recognized, we will not go everywhere, anywhere. We will just gather the few enthusiasts and uh, committed ones who believe in education and do not shun the overwork load and the uh, disadvantages that this might uh, create for their own careers and recognition. Uh, but we would not change the sector. So I think that's an important point. Um, if I move on then to the national level, and uh, I ask myself, is that it is a problem? I can see that, but is it really as big as a problem as you describe it there? So agreed, uh, there are language issues, uh, funding issues, there is accreditation. But if we look at, when we ask, for example, institutions about the main obstacles that they face in digitally enhanced learning and teaching, um, only from a very few countries, we got the answer that national level regulation, external QA and, and, and is the problem. So, um, and uh, that's basically also confirmed uh, from the autonomy scorecard, where we can see that, for example, curriculum development is in most countries, you can do that uh, as an institution, you have quite a bit of autonomy to define that. But I think you have a point there and uh, that institutional and national systems are not 
necessarily conducive to uh, what universities want to do and should do. And I really want to highlight here the case study of the Jagiellonian University, because that's not um, just uh, highlighting how, how uh, the many good things that the Jagiellonian and the other universities do, but it really makes the concrete point of the problems. And I think we need more of this and across Europe. And we have to look at the concrete problems that are there and then think about ways on how to tackle them. And I think the European universities initiatives, generally in the university uh, collaboration is a good way, of course, to uh, identifying them, highlighting them. My hunch would be that many of this, what we thought is implemented across Europe, like ECTS and NN, is has probably been done on a sub uh, level under the radar of uh, some of the national and also institutional regulation. And now when you try to upscale it and uh, implement it more radically, suddenly you have to explain that to your rector and to your senate, and then the question come and uh, the obstacles. Point about Bologna, and uh, I think it's it would be a misunderstanding to say Bologna is about an average strategy, at least for us, and I think also from the colleagues from ministries who have been in the Bologna process, it's really seen about creating a framework that is sufficiently flexible for higher education institutions and their members to act and make sure that education flourishes. So you have the bachelor and masters, the QA, the QF, and then, and, but it's more like a like a broad road and infrastructure to do that than rather pres than prescribing what, what you should do there. On the concrete issue of learning and teaching, Bologna has be actually been rather agnostic. If you look what Bologna said about learning and teaching, it hailed learning outcomes, it hailed student-centered learning um, it, and promoted them, but it has not really defined them. So it really left that for the sector. The question that I take from your paper is, should that change? Should Bologna try to be more supportive and enhance the um, opportunities for universities there? And I think that's probably something that we should discuss because since uh, the last uh, circle of Bologna, we have a working group on that. And being in this working group, we found it actually very difficult to tell governments what they should do other than that they should support, encourage, inspire, and fund higher education. So as the new Bologna cycle is just starting now, maybe this is something that we should take up and discuss with you and other organizations more closely. What should Bologna do in the next round to improve the situation of institutions? Um, I just can support what Vanessa said about and uh, what you said in your paper about uh, lifelong learning. I think that's a really important point. And I also think that it, it goes beyond uh, micro credentials, of course. What we think is that the mission, the mission of higher education institutions and lifelong learning is not fully recognized. That's a very superficial thing now, and we would have to go down also in the different uh, national uh, systems, why that is actually so and how that could be uh, um, improved. Last point that I want to make here is about university networks and associations that you make in that paper. And of course, this is also something that we would support and just making the points that this is, of course, a much broader landscape than just the um, U European university initiatives and the guilds and uh, like uh, organizations. And in this regards, I'm really grateful that you invited me here today. Um, EUA is ready to collaborate with you on these issues and uh, use our muscle basically and our position to bring them also up to European level in the European education area and of course in the European higher education area. So that's from my side for the moment. Thank you, Michael. Um, can I, so, so there are a whole range of issues that uh, that you you have both raised. Can I maybe start with the first, which is, I guess, a little bit of the element in, in the elephant in the room. As soon as you start talking about um, the sort of technological transformation that we've also just experienced. So, um, and and Vanessa, maybe starting uh, with you. Um, so, I mean, we're talking at a time when we're at the back end of an academic year, which has been just incredibly tough for, for students and for tutors um, and, uh, and administrators all along. I mean, we've all been in this together, uh, at the commission indeed. And, and 
you know, where people have had to do so much without any extra resource, sometimes less. Um, when we think about the esteem of teaching, there's a real question about how institutions then juggle this. Um, and so, so the question to you, I guess, is so first of all, there's of course something going on at European level now as we think about how we re-evaluate careers. And, 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 and I think there is also a discussion about academic careers, which allows, I think some of the things that Michael said, maybe to, to, to be brought up uh, a bit more. But, but there's also, in more concrete terms, Vanessa, a question really about the funding. So do you detect at your level where you sit a greater willingness of, of education ministers to, to and of science ministers to give greater weight to, to uh, funding students and to, and to provide the resource that it actually takes to do um, digital learning properly, given that we are at a time also of, of uh, very difficult public finance. And a corollary is that in a sense of, to you as a funder, right? To, to the commission as a funder, because there's also a real question about how funders um, provide, pro for instance, proper funding to research projects so that um, there is no need to cross subsidize between research and education. So I guess, yeah. It, it, it's many questions in, in one, but uh, I'll try to, to address uh, all, all your points, Jan. Uh, when it comes to the academic careers, I, I can only subscribe to what you said, that uh, indeed what we observe at, at European level, and it's valid in, in many countries, is that education is not recognized at the same level as research activities, and that this is a real issue. As you said, if we want to reach excellence in pedagogies, it needs to be rewarded in, in, the, in the career of, of staff. So that's, that's a real challenge, actually. The Research Working Party has adopted council conclusions recently on, uh, on the research uh, careers. And here we we, we've been dis, we've been involved a little bit in these discussions, and we have put forward this idea to not forget the education part. So we are quite happy that now this is part of the of the council conclusions, which is a good start for then the the next steps and what we can propose in the coming uh, council council recommendations. So attached to the European strategy for universities. Uh, we are aiming at providing a number of council recommendations to provide recommendations to the member states, but also to the commission on how we can incentivize these, these transformations. So one will be on, on lifelong learning and micro credentials. One will be on education for environmental sustainability. Another one may be on how we can support deeper transnational cooperation. As you said, as you said before, European universities are a bit the, the front runners and, and the pioneers in, in that front. And what we are learning with them and, and many of you today, um, it is really the, the limit of how the Bologna instruments have been implemented so far by the member states and how we can make it more flexible in the way it is implemented um, so far. And as, as Michael said, there is, there, there is a need for, uh, for deep reflection there because, because we see when it comes to accreditation, to quality assurance, there are, there are a lot of uh, limitations there. So when it comes to funding, it also triggers many questions, not only in terms of level of funding, but also the criteria uh, for providing that funding. And you know that it's very, there is such a huge diversity between all the member states in, in how higher education institutions are funded. And, and actually there is a, an ongoing study uh, at our level to map a little bit these different funding models and, and to get some recommendations uh, for, for the future. Because if and, and this is why it is so important to have this collective strategy, because I think funding models, we need to be reviewed in the context of such a European strategy. If we want to have better recognition of education, if we want to have more transdisciplinary approaches, more transnational approaches, finding the right balance between, between um, and digital and, and uh, physical education learning. All this needs to be reflected in these funding models. So 
what is good, and, and you said whether we see the ministers being willing to get these discussions, my answer is yes. Uh, actually, they have been asking for uh, putting these discussions and investments as part of the priorities to be discussed in the context of the European Education Area. And there is a new, uh, if you want, a working group that has been set up with members from the member states to have a huge reflection, not only when it comes to higher education research, but also covering all the different sectors, including school education and the reflection that we're having with this group is really it's not only about level of funding but again level of funding with which impact and how can we monitor the impact of such level of, of, uh, of funding. So you see that it's a wide discussion. It's level of funding, it's, it's how, based on which criteria we provide funding, and then it's about monitoring the impact of such, uh, of such funding. Um, there, there is, you know, uh, um, a lot of uh, different European instruments to fund universities. There is, of course, Erasmus+, Plus. there is Rise in Europe, but there is also the, the next generation. AU, the recovery funds, and now the, the, the countries are, are presenting their strategy on how they can use the, the recovery funds. Here, we're quite happy that a number of countries are using them to bring, to invest in higher education, to make it in some countries they are focusing on inclusion, some others on digitalization, for example, these digital uh, issues. Um, so that's very good. That's very good. I think it's a, it's a very good move. Uh, we we may, may hope in some countries to see more of that. And uh, let's, be, let's be transparent. Uh, but it's it's a very positive move. Now, what, what we hear is that sometimes universities a bit lost, you know, with all these different instruments and all these different criteria. So maybe there, there, there may be a need, and, and this is a question for you, if you could see a, an added value, if at Open Devon, together with my colleagues in DG Research, but also other departments, we would come up with, with more guidance to, to higher education institutions in how to make best use of this European funding, together with, of course, the discussion that we are having with the member states on, on this crucial investment in education, particularly in higher education. Thank you. Um, Joe, I think you wanted to come in and, and maybe have a, offer a few, a few quick reflections to Vanessa's and I suspect also uh, particularly Michael's, um, Michael's intervention. Thanks, Jan. I've, I've been uh, making notes, uh, which are getting longer and longer, and I think then uh, I, I, I check the time that I have two minutes. So I, I, don't know where to begin, uh, but I very, first of all, I very much and thoroughly support uh, both the ethos and the principle and, and Vanessa, the, 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 the position uh, of what you're saying and, and also the opportunity uh, to, uh, for, uh, for the guidance uh, to be clear and connect as to how the institution should engage. Um, I think there is uh, th there, there is definitely something that connects uh, one of the sort of core points that I would like to reflect on that um, that is is really important the support for um, for for learning networks for pedagogic innovation to create this infrastructure that would enable to apply strategy to learn from good practice but also to incentivize and that cuts very much into what Michael was saying about parity of esteem. This is something that I'm really passionate about, so I'm just trying to sort of not get too passionate about it right now. But uh, Michael is, is is very much the sort of the heart of the issue. Uh, it's 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 still very much uh, everywhere around us, and and uh, until we actually achieve parity of esteem, uh, then uh, we would uh, still very much not uh, be in a position where we would be able to have the proper recognition. Uh, I'm sure a number of colleagues have had the experiences that uh, I've had in my career. I've always been a, a strategic research hire. I've always had large education roles. I still have very senior research work at uh, sort of different um, research councils and so on, uh, and also education role uh, with um, education and learning uh, councils. And, 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 and what I see still is that when I'm in my research world, Nobody asks me about what I do in my education world. When they do that, it's very often to 
uh, offer commiserations and um, to ask me why, why I'm still doing all those things. And actually often the same when in my education and teaching and learning world, very rarely do I have a chance to talk about what I do as a researcher. I fundamentally think that this is damaging. It is political, it's ideological, mm -hmm. It actually really not serve our sexes. We really need to change it. And, and I think that's something that we can change. And, and I would very much welcome to actually see uh, support in incentivizing and, and, and sort of offering ways to, um, to, to offer the recognition and for uh, pushing really uh, the sector to really do it because that is something where we can achieve change. And that's also something very important that we have an enormous power, enormous collective power to actually do it. So there are certain things that we can do. There are certain other things that we need to debate to actually bring and find solutions. But uh, I think some of those that we know are big blocks. Uh, and, and I think we should start uh, by providing um, ways uh, that we can go beyond uh, what we actually experience and we know the situation right now. Um, so um, I think that's probably more or less my time, but I think also having the uh, opportunity to uh, to identify this very fine equilibrium we need uh, between our approaches to and our understanding of autonomy and what autonomy can and should do, both from individual academic level to institutional, to regional, to national, to international, and how actually this needs to work with flexible systems uh, that enable, uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 enable creativity and enable pedagogic innovation to actually grow. I think that's very important. And, and to me, we have seen fantastic good practice over the years. What is often missing is a sort of critical link from moving a pilot to implementation, a good experiment to the mainstream, a good initiative that remains in sort of peripheries of institution to becoming something that can be embedded in the curriculum journey so that it can actually touch and enrich the experience of all students. And I think this to me is really the important question. How can we move into embedding, into building in where we know we have a lot of very good experience? How can we make this? Can we actually make this a reality for the majority of our students and to then mobilize it to create new and alternative pathways so that we can also address all the portfolio that we want to address to see an inclusive uh, higher education with more credit pathways alongside traditional degrees and so on. Um, I'll stop. I see Jan sort of uh, telling me <laughs> in his embodied way, Joe, really. <laughs> so I'm stopping here, but thank you. Thank you really so much. And I'm so much looking forward to all the conversations that uh, we will be having in the seminars. Um, Great. Um, so, so uh, Michael, before I bring you back into the conversation and then Vanessa, can I also throw in an addition, so clearly many points raised by Joe as well, um, but can I just raise one further the, the point, um, uh, Michael, that uh, uh, arises straight from your point about the Bologna reforms and maybe the need to kind of align Bologna more closely or find new ways of aligning Bologna, uh, um, uh, the Bologna framework, which is only a framework, as you note, um, with, with HE concerns. And I just wonder whether in some ways the European education area could in a sense be the missing link or whether the European strategy, Vanessa, that you were talking about could be the missing link that develops the vision that could then tell or could kind of inform the Bologna process more kind of what it then needs to do in order to fill that with life. Or does that not work given that of course there are very different remits, uh, there are different geographic scopes of the two. Uh, um, so maybe, maybe you might also reflect on, on that. Yeah. yeah, no, happy to do that. Just two very short comments, one on the funding side, because um, that's, that's, of course, an important issue. And just to remind that this is not all about European funding, but it's also about the funding that the institutions get at national level. And what we see really as a, as a kind of um, yeah, problem is if there is a growing em emphasis on performance-based funding, you know, if you have certain purposes behind it, and on the other hand, you find that institutions are actually chronically underfinanced. Yeah, and uh, you you know our publication on that. Uh, this is really not helping the sector in the end. You know, but just that's that's the point that so uh, institutions have to be properly funded, and then everything else can come on top, of course. And we see that also in 
were in the view of what's uh, the, the, the months and years to, to come after the crisis. I mean, it's not, not very likely that everywhere will be more funding around for higher education. So we have to be very smart about this. The second point was about what Joe just said and Vanessa about careers. And just to say also, it's not just about um, the research and education, but it's also about all the other things that are so important. The whole third mission, internationalization comes out strongly in you. So there are diverse careers in universities and we have to make sure that all this diversity is somehow these diverse approaches are recognized in career development and then end. And just to say, it's not just between research or, and other careers in, in the institution. Um, the problem is also on the research side, you know, the way how you assess and value research. And this is something that EUA is, has been taking up about a year or two years ago, in which we are discussing with uh, members and partners. But to your question about Bologna and the EHEA, and I'm sure Vanessa has a view on that, to our from our view, they are complementary. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't try to use one through the other, but they should be aligned. If in, if you in certain ways, and if you look around, I mean, uh, Vanessa and I, we meet at EEA events, and we meet uh, the week after at EHEA events, and we look around, and the colleagues are more or less the same. So I think that's a good opportunity to do our complementary and different things and different frameworks without ignoring what is done in the other one. Yeah, we will have to avoid to duplicate and to contradict, you know, but have a high level of alignment there. And I'm not really worried about that. I think the Bologna process has become more accessible for, um, for the sector. If you go through the publications that it has put out, the communicates of 2015, 18, and 20, they really make very clear that there has more work to take place with the sector. And it's also evident why. I mean, before it was about big structural reforms, but this is now about learning and teaching, about uh, uh, which is not done in the ministry, it's done at the institution. So it needs all this bottom-up um, inspiration, the bottom-up initiatives. As Joe said, they are emerging. We have, we have it all, and the crisis showed it, you know. Basically, we joined the dots of what was already there and activated a lot of good things uh, of digital experience, which was already there, but it wasn't mainstreamed. It wasn't rolled out throughout the institution. And I think you can take this as an analogy. We should use Bologna to do that. Yeah? Not in a top-down way, but really to share good practice, good ways forward, and try to find agreement on them. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. Yes, so I, I would like to, to of course, uh, agree with, with Michael. Now maybe I can, I can clarify the, the connection between the high education dimension of the European education area that is focused geographically in the member states and the European higher education area, which in globe 49 uh, members, um, I think they reinforce each other. So if you want, we could not go as deep as we can in the context of the European education area without the Bologna tools. And we are building on the Bologna tools that are so important. But I think we can, the added value of the European education area is that within the European Union, we can go a little bit faster and deeper because we have some instruments that we do not have in the context of Bologna, which is a voluntary process. So um, with this European strategy for universities and the attached council recommendations that we are working on, um, we can really incentivize um, member states to apply in a much more flexible way the Bologna commitments. At the moment, when we discuss with the European universities, they are facing really obstacles and big hurdles because of the rigidity in the way some member states are implementing uh, quality assurance systems or accreditations. So we need to be able within the European Union to really uh, um, try to, <laughs> to, to, to really yeah, open for, for such flexibility, which I am sure then will inspire all the countries that are members of the European higher education area. So I see it as an incremental process where any progress 
will 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 help the others to 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 progress and and the one will use the progress made in one area for the for the other area so that's really the way we we see this so it's fully complementary and as michael said no contradiction between one and the other Vanessa um, uh, and Michael, we're getting towards the end of this first panel, but I've got to ask you this before before we close this. Um, and it's uh, because we've we've uh, um, and Michael, you, you also raised this um, point that we've made in our a paper on international collaboration, and and the different kind of networks that we're seeing in the proliferation of international network. And, and in a way, we've we've made this point that in a sense, internationalization is really very very high up on all our agendas. But that in a sense, we also feel that we need to start um, articulating more clearly what exactly the value is. What is it that we're getting out of? What is the value proposition? And um, clearly we have this really exciting initiative of the European universities. And, and, and I guess the, the question when it comes to pedagogic innovation is what is it that, that we can, that this initiative enables us to do that, um, that we, we couldn't do as in institutions else, uh, uh, ourselves. Now, granted, there is a sharing of best practice, but of course, you can do that with your university down the road, right? I mean, so so in a sense, what is it? Um, how would you do, how would you articulate that initiative next to the other forms of collaborations that we are already seeing, that we have already seen, and that we will continue to see, both within Europe and beyond Europe? Vanessa, maybe starting with you, and then Michel. Okay, all right. Um, I think it's very well explained in the in your report that we need all these type of different networks because they have different objectives which are very much complementary. Um, at triple level, we see the added value of EUA or the Guild or Coimbra or Leru or many other networks as a platform for exchange between universities alike. So, so because of this wide diversity of the higher education landscape, needs can be different and it's very good to have these different networks uh, uh, bring together uh, universities having facing the same, the same issues, the same challenges and the added value is typically the report that you are presenting today, sharing all these good practices. The way we see the European universities is more in implementing together all these good practices that you have been exchanging in the other form network. So I think that's why the, the, we, we have changed a little bit the, the terminology around the European universities that we do not consider them an, a, as networks, but as, as really alliances, alliances showing a, a long-term vision that they are implementing uh, together. So it's really this implementation mm -hmm. uh, and that, that makes the huge difference between the two. And now when it comes to the pedagogic innovation, I, I think you've drafted somewhere in the report that these European universities can do much more than the sum of all their parts. And I like that very much in the, in the report actually, because when it comes to pedagogic innovation and you speak in the report about the importance of this, importance to have this key disciplinary expertise but at the same time to go beyond this disciplinary expertise so that students can learn together on how to look together between experts from different disciplines at complex issues such as sustainable development goals, etc. So, so we need this complementarity between both. Of course, you can organize it at, uh, between faculties within a given institution. But when you add to that this, this transnationality, um, you, you gain much more because of different cultures, because of different approaches that you're having looking at it. If you look with the, 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 the southern countries, you can st still see differences in the approaches as compared to northern countries. The same between East and West. So this is why these European universities, by bringing together these different perspectives, not only between different different disciplines, but also all this history, all these different cultural approaches that makes it so rich. And I was so happy to, to attend a, a conference recently from four different European universities where the students spoke and they spoke about their experience. And they said, but it's so rich. 
that you know having this possibility to to cooperate with uh, with other students from other disciplines from north east as western and east and, and what they told us is that communicate communicate more about it because even within the uh, given institutions students are not aware about these fantastic opportunities and i think this is a real challenge for the european universities at the moment to make these opportunities uh, um, well known um, among the, the huge uh, student and, and staff body within the institutions. Thank you, and Michael. Well, I think uh, Vanessa captured it already very well. It's about it's really about uh, learning at, at different levels in the institution, and also about I would say well deep learning probably. There's a different thing on whether you look at each other and listen to each other or whether you actually start to do things together. And we have seen that in many different ways. I mean, uh, the joint degrees were a good example, which I think which have brought in a major uh, movement into learning. It, it's a stuff learning approach. Uh, that's what joint degrees actually became, isn't it? it I mean, international experience for students but all, and learning, of course, but also stuff learned through it, how curricula are developed elsewhere and uh, uh, the whole, academic and teaching culture that you have at other institutions. We do, we do that also uh, regularly st through our thematic uh, peer groups where we bring vice rectors together and they exchange among each other. And uh, there is a lot of evidence that they go back and uh, I mean, it gives them the inspiration of doing things, but it also, when, you, when they start then collaborating as you do in joint degrees or also in collaboration, you also become much more aware of the different issues that you have in different systems. And I think that makes for the deeper learning. By contrast, you can have exchanges for years uh, without understanding anything about the systems in which people work. Look at all the exchanges that, that we have with the US, but who really knows how a, U, how a US university functions? Yeah, Very few probably do. So I think that would be my point here. And it's moving, it's about the program, but also the whole institution. So it's really adds to what we want to be, the learning institutions. Um, Joe, any final reflections on, on what you've heard in this panel? I'll just say three words. Um, I think it's actually the sort of moving from uh, having sort of this linear connection and seeing them as something that sort of connects uh, one to one or mm. one area of activity or another to creating really a, a matrix. Uh, and, and if we achieve that, this is really how we can articulate uh, the uh, value-added proposition and also uh, make it relevant uh, to the whole experience in our universities instead of uh, lim limiting to those who immediately participate. So it's basically translating the opportunity and, and move from the singular to the plural, from, from mobility to mobilities, and look into sort of a portfolio of opportunity and also a portfolio of opportunity to capitalize on the work we do so that this experience is invested uh, in creating this transformational potential. And I, I think to me, this is really the deep opportunity that we have right now uh, and, and connect um, collaboration, which as, as Jan said, they sort of, there's a lot of value in collaboration in sort of the regional, national and international. And by opening those channels where we can bring the value of regional net, networks to the Cross European, there, there is a fantastic opportunity for this place making uh, orientation that so many institutions want to have. There's this very good work that is happening to benefit others and, and benefit other regions and then connect with other parts of uh, strategies that we want to achieve. Um, but it's also how to unblock the barriers that, on, on, on that we have on the way to achieve this uh, matrix uh, of connections. So I want to end this first panel with a thank you, of course, to our uh, first uh, set of speakers. Um, and I would like maybe just by way of summary, I would, um, you know, like to thank the Commission, but also urge us all to, to kind of really participate in this dialogue about the European strategy for, Euro for universities, because that can only really be fruitful and, and, and have legs if we all really engage with it and if it really genuinely expresses what we feel to be um, true about our journey uh, ourselves. Um, and there are many opportunities, Vanessa pointed to one, but, but there, there will be others. So, so um, I would urge us all to take part. Um, I would really appeal to you, Vanessa, also to kind of um, uh, 
take our side and, and, and really um, um, in, engage on our behalf uh, when it really does come to this question of resource in, in terms of in your discussions with the national ministers, um, as we've discussed, this is not just a European question, it's also very much a national question. And when I see ministers um, making comments that actually now that we've got digital, the digital classroom, then we no longer need to fund per student because in a sense it's all the same. You know, th there are some really, quite worrying um, ways, uh, signals that we pick up um, at a time of, of declining public resource. Um, and so I do think this is, this is an area where we really do need to um, uh, engage together to, to insist on the importance and value that we do not for our own sake and not simply for our students, but actually for society um, at large. So, uh, but maybe with, with that um, background, I'll move to the second panel. We already have a first question that is, is, is a more, uh, one more practice. Um, uh, and we will come back to this question in, in the Q&A session. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our second panel here. Um, so uh, beginning with uh, Benoit Rosson, who is the president of the Lou Louvain Learning Lab. Um, and the Louvain Learning Lab is remarkable, not just because it's, a, it's an outstanding incubator for uh, innovative pedagogy, but it has existed really for over 25 years now. So this, is, this has got a very, very long history of engaging with changing mediums of education and with, invade, uh, with, with change. And so I'm really uh, delighted to welcome uh, Benoit. Um, Ruta Aydukevicine is the uh, Dean of Humanities at uh, Vitaltas Magnus University in Kaunas in Lithuania. Um, and this is a university that was refounded in 1989 um, to embody the significance of universities for, for in a sense, civic, um, cultural and social uh, well-being. So this, this university in itself embodies the value of universities uh, for society and for us. And in, in a very short time, it's already merged as one of uh, Lithuania's top two uh, comprehensive uh, universities. I hope I can uh, say this uh, here. And then we have uh, Jeroen Kuhlmann, who is a, a professor um, of, at the Department of Internal Medicine, but he's also the director of the Ed Lab at uh, Maastricht University. Um, and Maastricht, of course, is uh, widely known for its pioneering role um, in uh, the, the adoption of problem-based learning. So um, I couldn't wish for a, uh, a better panel to, uh, to share their reflections. And maybe uh, Benoit, if I uh, start with, uh, if, if we start with, with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you share the, the, the slide, please? Yeah, I, I just want to, to emphasize some key elements of, 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 of the paper, because I think it's quite very important. And what I want just to, to show you in, in five uh, slides is uh, three uh, observations and four, and four lessons of the uh, pandemic uh, uh, crisis. Can you show us the, the second one, please? Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the first aspect is that we know that uh, socialization is a very important uh, aspect. A and camera is not a technical problem, but a pedagogical one. And so we, we observe that Socialization is, is an important topic. The, the, uh, the next one, please. The second observation is that the, um, the experience is quite different depending on the, on the situation of uh, each other. Uh, the situation can be in a social context, but also the need of, of the people. So this means that there is clearly a, a need for more flexibility in programs and uh, activities. Next slide, please. And the third element, I think it's a very important one, but maybe it's more complex. Um, due to the, to the COVID, we, we had to move from in-person and online for teaching and for assessment. And in this process for moving from in-person to online, maybe in some time, we, we, um, we fail in the alignment principle. This means that we had on presence, maybe a alignment between the teaching activities and the assessment, but on the moving um, process, sometimes we, we, we lose this uh, alignment. And so alignment is becoming a very key element in the reflection. And so we, we now will see the four, um, uh, four lesson. Can you see the next one, please? So the first of all, as I said, uh, there was a very large variety of need, and we have to think about lifelong learning. This means that um, we have to seek for more flexibility in the, in the activities, but also in the program. People are looking for short, 
micro credentials, show, show, show program, and so on. So we have to, to be more flexible regarding that. Uh, the, the next one, please. The second lesson is that um, uh, we know that the, the, the classical way of teaching um, has uh, some limitation. And we have to move for pedagogical innovation, as many people said. So we have to look for PBL approach. We have to look for um, research, um, uh, uh, learning approach, uh, flipped classroom, and so on. There are many uh, of it, but we have, we have to move from stage, uh, stage on the stage to guide on the side. So it's quite important to change the philosophy of, uh, of the teaching. And the next one, please. Uh, another important aspect is the way we see internationalization. And we have to think more deeper in how can we organize internationalization. I just show you an example. We, we can use uh, online courses with international experts. This means that we will follow courses from experts any, anywhere in the, in, the, in the world. And then we could have teamwork based on web conferencing and we could have local activities. So we can, we can combine this in, in a more uh, powerful way. And the last uh, slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the last one is um, the fact that in order to implement this, we have to uh, provide more importance of, of education. And we have to find a better balance between research and innovative pedagogy. So th this means that we have to, um, to implement a, a real um, way of, for example, a subtle strategy inside the, uh, the, the university. So that's what I want to say, but of course, I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you very much, Benoit. That's wonderful. And before we get to the question and answers, uh, maybe uh, uh, Ruta, if I might ask you to. Uh, Hello, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to this event and the opportunity to discuss some, uh, some education strategy issues with you. And first of all, I would like to share some thoughts uh, and I'm going to do that from the different personal perspectives as a member of university administration, but also as a teacher and researcher in the field of humanities. And uh, as Jan mentioned, I represent the university applying the principles of liberal arts. Uh, and that's why I'm the most familiar with the, the advantages and challenges of such institutions. And uh, we all know, and we have heard it today, uh, the transformation of traditional professional models and the increasing individualization of education process demand more and more different study options. In this sense, there are many opportunities or advantages for the universities, university schools that enable their students to combine individual courses far beyond the actual study subject or study program, and thus impart relevant skills for future independent qualification. But of course, trying to expand uh, uh, the freedom of choice in studies and the individualization of the study process, uh, we face challenges as all universities do. And regarding the digital digitalization, uh, just to give one example, it is not enough to change from face-to-face -face, uh, learning to online learning uh, on individual course level or even on study program level because our curricula, they include an essential part of introductory courses to various branches of science and arts. And also it's necessary to transform uh, all this introductory part, if we want to offer the same options for all our students from traditional, uh, I would say traditional study programs also and online study programs. So the benefit of digitalization are benefits are beyond all doubt when we speak about monitoring assessment of the study process. It's also very important for strengthening the relationship between academia and uh, uh, other institutions, especially uh, in cases of reskilling or recognizing competences uh, acquired in not 
formal way. However, there are still a lot of challenges, a lot of problems when it comes to formal teaching and learning. And so the virtual learning, online learning seems to be uh, convenient for lectures and to some extent for seminars. Still, there are uh, many problems in case of research-led or experience-led projects and students' teamwork, the study uh, methods, study competences, or even uh, study outcomes uh, that, especially in times of pandemic, should be valid the most, this uh, student teamwork, cooperation, collaboration. And uh, that, unfortunately, I think seem to decrease in number at the moment. And I suppose because of the fear of some teachers that it is virtually difficult to implement. And uh, uh, especially in humanity, students uh, and teachers, uh, uh, they appreciate face-to-face -face, uh, uh, discussions and creative work environment very much. And so the model that our university now is considering includes approximately 80% of face-to-face uh, -face learning and maybe 20, 25% of uh, uh, blended or virtual learning because it's also very important uh, for inclusion of vulnerable social groups and also inclusion for, for students uh, in, in part employment or even in, in full-time employment. And uh, as a teacher, I am really very convinced and I have experience uh, with and I am convinced that studies in humanities, studies in philology and other uh, subject fields, they should respond to, to the demands of students, not only to handle professionally the specific contents acquired in their studies, but also uh, provide them with key skills uh, such as self-confidence, creativity, flexibility, and uh, to facilitate their participation in future professional life. And I think nobody doubts the question that and why the experience and action-oriented uh, learning should have its fixed place in university teaching. Uh, however, there are still many problems uh, integrating such research-based study projects into existing curricula. And the questions always are, and uh, we have discussions at our university, should they be integrated in bigger course units? Should be, they be carried out parallel to some courses or should it be offered as individual course units? And maybe the last and one more, I think, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges and the, that needs support also on the university level is building well-functioning networks uh, of motivated stakeholders, actually, that sees the benefits and the, also there's a kind of strategy strategic decisions to be involved in such students' uh, activities. And so when someone outside the academia uh, shows interest in the project results uh, and wants it implemented, so this leads to a significant increase of, of student uh, motivation and also higher learning effect. Uh, of course, it is important for the visibility of the university, also for the stakeholders involved. And, but of course, it's a challenge for teachers uh, to ensure that a valuable result is created for the customer so that she or he uh, is potentially available for future projects. So I, I think also this cooperation with stakeholders is also very important and should be supported on the university level as well, so maybe kind of some uh, introduction remarks and thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Ruta. And uh, last but certainly not least, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, Jan, also for the invitation. Um, uh, good morning to all. Yeah, I think it was a very uh, a good and stimulated document, which I read with a lot of new insights, and I think really kind of a first roadmap for our uh, future. And first, what I would like to comment on is actually the, the, the possible chances which we have of the lessons of the COVID pandemic for international collaboration. That is actually also stimulated by our large experience, which we 
had to achieve in very uh, short periods of time with the introduction of, of online environments. And, and, and also actually we, and, and you know, Maastricht, we do problem-based learning um, based on small group learning. And we had to adjust actually uh, over a single day nearly to, uh, to do this all online. And actually it, let's say it, it went well from from uh, let's say a learning perspective uh, students were able to 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 learn what they um, uh, uh, wanted to learn were supposed to learn but what you also saw is that um, uh, the societal the let's say the, the the impact of the of meeting each other the societal impact of of, of learning and uh, the collaborative impact of learning actually decreased by these uh, purely online line environments and if you want to look into the future actually i think and i, I think that the international mobility either um, uh, whether it is virtual or really physically each other should be um, should be fostered and, and you could very well think of hybrid approaches because I think young people um, uh, uh, like to travel like to meet other people you cannot do this properly purely online and I, I think a combination of international mobility uh, uh, with if people uh, if the students come back in their their home universities um, uh, uh, stimulated by interdisciplinary projects with people from different universities which you got to meet that would really be I think in uh, let's say good asset for the for the for the future in a way and in, in Maastricht actually there's also we are part of a, an initiative it's called Young Universities for the Future of Europe the UFA and actually it's also uh, they they built a virtual campus on that and yeah it was trying to make a beginning with this type of um, uh, initiatives in a way and I, I hope this will also be set yeah let's say the stage for them um, for the for the future but importantly it's and that's more for the first panel also you need a harmonization and quality assurance systems and recognition of um, uh, uh, of study activities which were done at other universities and in the end uh, probably a European kind of diploma would be um, I think the ultimate uh, ultimate goal but it will be um, long before this has been um, been achieved. Uh, also would like to react on research-based education and I come from the medical field and we have a lot of papers on COVID and what it would mean and we learned a lot from this and I, uh, I think it would also uh, be very good for the educational community and I know there are quite some efforts on that actually to also to share what we all learned from the COVID uh, experience because um, uh, in the, and in the end come and actually expand the whole spectrum of research-led education also by uh, going to a, a more evidence way of, of, of education learning what worked and what did not work. And at that lab, that's also an initiative, what we did at least did in our own university to look what we should keep, what we should uh, uh, certainly not keep, and also try to learn from uh, from um, from educational um, uh, yeah, uh, experiences in other, uh, in other universities. And I think as a, as, as a European network, we could really learn from each other and, and build, yeah, let's say, an, an even better education for them uh, for the for the, for the future. Uh, so I, I think actually it's also called to include this on, 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 on research-led education. I strongly value the, the role of research in, in education. It's, it's sure, surely at an undergraduate level also to stimulate critical thinking, collaboration together. So it could also, does not necessarily have to be, I think, in the start of the, 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 the undergraduate career to be purely research, but it could also be project or challenge based. It's, it's about, I think, firstly about stimulating critical thinking, working together, collaboration and uh, an interdisciplinary project. That's actually what I, and there's a lot more to learn from, from, from this wonderful paper, but these were actually the first thoughts which, which came to my mind when, when reading it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I just, uh, before I go back to the panelists, can I just bring in uh, Joe uh, Anguri again, because there's a, there's a question um, that was submitted by um, uh, a member of the audience, uh, by uh, Johanna Anala. And uh, Joe, do you want to just um, um, reflect on the, uh, read and reflect on the question? Thank you, yes. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thanks very much to the colleague for the question, a very important one. Uh, uh, the first is how much we've engaged. The first part of the question is uh, how much the paper uh, draws uh, on uh, existing literature, uh, research literature on um, uh, research-led education and undergra undergraduate research. Uh, so uh, the answer is that uh, we have engaged uh, very much with um, what, what is available uh, and, and and we're trying in the paper uh, you will find uh, when you uh, when it reaches you that you, there is a section mm -hmm. that is exactly trying to provide a synthesis uh, and a meta comment uh, the argument we're taking is that there is a lot of good work and and you're referring to some pieces and some of the work that advanced he has been doing and so on 
what we're trying to do in the paper is to actually provide uh, sort of a meta comment uh, on the sort of terminological polyphony we have from inquiry-based teaching and learning, research-based teaching and learning, research-led teaching, research-led learning, research-linked teaching and learning, research-oriented teaching and learning, research-informed teaching, and actually all of those come with their own disciplinary traditions and literatures and so on. And what we're trying to do is uh, to actually show uh, a little bit or the sort of the diversity, of course, the different, the different designs and formats and pedagogic practice that exists uh, and, uh, and, and, and sort of move and relate those to active learning pedagogies and how it connects uh, with the current policy frame. So in, in the sort of uh, always impossible challenge uh, of a short paper, we tried very much to uh, take both um, the, uh, the literature and the scholarship in that area. Um, I, I think comparing to the importance of the topic, we need more work in that. So there is still what I think is relatively little compared to uh, how significant it is in so many different ways. Uh, and we've also connected with policy uh, and policy documents uh, and where we had uh, opportunities to connect with examples. And some of the case studies, exactly because it's so central, uh, we also try to illustrate and draw uh, on existing expertise uh, through uh, some of the case studies. And that's why in that part of the paper, you will see two case studies when, when uh, you have a chance to, uh, to take a look. So I hope, I hope that is an answer to the first part. Uh, and the second uh, is around uh, micro-credentials and forms of knowledge. Um, I, I would like to sort of flag here that uh, we will have a lot of opportunity to discuss this on the 29th of June. And I really hope that uh, you will join us there um, because we are going to really uh, open up and discuss the role of research-led institutions in establishing alternative credit pathways, uh, good experience that we have in the sector, how we can work with other providers. Uh, I think the position we're taking is that, of course, there is no easy and one answer to that uh, in terms of what the format, the content, and how it can work uh, with other learning opportunities. Uh, but uh, what is important is that the quality of the learning experience, the quality of the experience of the adult learner, uh, and, and the uh, university's mission to provide holistic and transformative education is very much a need to maintain whatever design. So micro-credentials are any is, is part of a jigsaw, is, is, and it's, it's part of a bigger solution, not their solution in itself. So um, this is just to basically say very important uh, fundamentally one of the issues that we really want to use as a conduit into discussing how we can work together, how we should work together, um, what we can learn from one another, and hopefully we will continue this part of the discussion uh, on the 29th of June. Thank you. Uh, can I, can I uh, maybe um, now um, also uh, bring some uh, questions from uh, Participants who um, who provided questions at the registration to uh, maybe Benoit and also Jeroen, um, uh, and starting with you, Benoit. Um, so I, I guess a twofold question: In an online environment, how do you increase? Um, do you have any wise thoughts about how we increase students' motivation? Uh, uh, you know, given given that that can be a, a real challenge, uh, and also from your rich experience in in the learning lab at, at UC Leuven. How do you encourage and reward teaching innovation? Uh, I will start with the second one. Okay. Um, I think to, to answer the how to encourage, uh, uh, maybe uh, there are two levels in the answer. Maybe the global level uh, and the more practical level. I will start with the global level. Well, the global level, we have to, we have to implement scholarship of teaching, uh, teaching and learning strategy into university. And as well, uh, we have to, um, to implement evidence-based education. I think that's the two key elements in order to, to, to promote uh, such things. And, and so practically, um, what can we do? First of all, we have to provide trainings. This means that any teacher uh, may have the opportunity to follow a training session about how to make, to make innovation, how to use problem-based learning, research-based learning, anything like that. So we have to provide uh, trainings to people. Uh, the, the second thing we can, we can do is to um, uh, try to um, um, use the, the, the sharing aspect. We, we know that to promote people, uh, you, we, we can organize a, a session when people share their expertise, share their experience. And this is a double win-win situation because the people who will 
share, you know, uh, it is quite interesting for, for him or for her to be on the, on, on the stage and the other will we'll learn from, from the other. We implemented this uh, at Louvain and it's really, really very interesting how people uh, re respond to this, uh, to this opportunity. Uh, in, in the same way, uh, we can um, help people try funding for them to participate to pedagogical uh, conferences. So that's also a kind of valorization. And, and then the, the third practical thing is the, um, working on the, on the promotion process. Uh, for example, uh, in Louvain, we, we implement what we call the teaching portfolio. This means that if, if anyone wants to, 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 get promote, to, get, to get promoted, he has to write down and to present his teaching portfolio to a commission. And at the same time, we work with the commission and we introduce the commission a, a, a list of criteria. We use a rubric, a grid, if, if, you, if you know such uh, practical uh, uh, tools, in order to evaluate um, application in pedagogy as well as application in research. And so it's important to have very clear criteria and to, to, so that the, 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 the professor can be assessed on, on, on both on research and on the pedagogical uh, innovation. Regarding your, your, uh, your first question, uh, in, in fact, um, how to, to motivate uh, students, there are quite practical aspects, working in groups uh, and so on. But I think the, the key element is, is to work on the cycle, contextualization, decontextualization, recontextualization. This means you start with a, a clear question. In PBL, you start with a problem. But, but it can be a research problem, it can be anything, it can be a question, anything you want, but something will, that will trigger the, 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 the mentality. So there are different kinds of, of uh, good uh, uh, contextualization, but it's interesting to start with something that they will find an interest in. And then, based on that, they have to recognize that it's not possible to, to solve this problem or this challenge without learning something. And this motivates them to learn. That's the decontextualization phase. This means that based on the problem, you are looking to learn something you need to solve the problem. And at the end of the process, the recontextualization, really you, you come back to the first problem or to another one, and, and you, you propose, you, up, you applicate, you, you propose a solution to, to a to classical problem. So the, the key element is to start with a question, a problem, a situation, that have some interest in the student uh, aspect. You, you have three other aspects of, of, for, for engaging people. The second one is the, the, the level of the problem you, you, you propose to them. It should at the right level. If it's too complex, they won't get engaged because it's too complex. If it's not complex enough, they will not go for it because it's too easy to solve. And the, 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 the last one, it's not the easiest one, is the fact that people have to choose what they want to, what they want to do. So you give them at least one part of freedom. It can be selecting the, the starting point of the problem. It can be a way you will organize. You, 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 you can, it can be the, what you want to, to learn. But anything that they need to have to choose something in the process. Because as we do as uh, as teacher in, in research, we choose the research you want to, to work in, we choose your teams, we choose everything. We, we need to give students more choose in the process of learning. Thank you. Jeroen, do you have any, any additional comments on that? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, first, going to the to the students, it's indeed quite a challenge uh, if you go from uh, uh, small groups of people working together in a, in a nice campus environment to go online. And I also had the experience as a as a teacher uh, working with the small groups. Uh, from a cognitive point of view, it's 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 uh, possible to to get to the knowledge uh, as already mentioned what uh, what needs to be achieved. But uh, let's say that the whole personal contact it's uh, it, it's much more difficult. And uh, the, probably the answer 
mentor lies next to what have been well already mentioned also in, in trying to engage uh, students and teachers together as much as, as possible. Uh, yeah, we have, of course, our online small groups working. This has all had, all had to go through through Zoom. But what actually has an experience, because at that lab, we're also responsible, for instance, for excellence programs for master students. And I saw there the value of, of interdisciplinary projects or, um, or, 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 or group projects uh, with a clear goal um, in which students had to work together. They, um, they for instance, they built their own website on Tumblr, had to comment on each other's website. And in the end, actually, the projects were uh, discussed in a large online and environment. And uh, this actually seems to be very motivated. So it has also kept, let's say, the, the, the students, but also teachers uh, connected in a way. So actually trying to, to make this connection uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and even in an online environment, getting people to meet each other as, as, as much as possible, uh, because otherwise they will uh, probably lose connection and, and, and get, um, get detached from the, from the university, which is not completely um, preventable, uh, uh, regrettably. Of course, also um, for a teacher, it actually more or less holds the same. Also in, in our universities, there have been teachers who have not been at the campus for March, since March 2020, which is a very long period of time. And this also means that people can get in, can get aloof. And um, uh, it's also, I think, very good to involve teacher. Now, what we try to do at that lab is to... Um, get teachers to meet in what we call teach meets, uh, to share experiences. We also organized um, uh, uh, professional activities, uh, continuous professional activities, actually uh, trying to learn from each other, but also from educationalists, uh, how to best um, uh, develop your, your teaching and, uh, and your teaching strategies, that's just one. And importantly, actually also for the teacher, it's also kind of technical support. A lot of problems in the beginning, what we had, had is, is actually there were technical supports, problem with the uh, uh, electronic learning environments, trust problems with Zoom, recording videos, etc. So also you have to keep this kind of very practical support and uh, you have to put this in, in place. These were really lessons also which we had to, uh, to, to learn. But I think the basic one is actually to get people connected, to get people just to meet each other in, even if it is in a virtual uh, environment. That would be next to, I think, uh, to the comments of Benoit, on which I fully agree, uh, my addition. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you wanted to come in on, on a couple of points. Um... Yeah, if I may, so a really interesting contribution, so a good discussion. Um, pro probably starting with what Jerome said, I completely agree. I mean, the lessons learned that we get from this exercise, uh, I mean, this will have to be written up, and I think a good part of it will come when you are hopefully very soon back on campus and bring together the virtual and the uh, physical realities. The points that um, Benoit and Ruta made is actually about assessment and also about team working. I just wonder, is that also an example? Would you say that this is an example of things that are difficult virtually online, but they are also virtually on uh, uh, difficult on, sorry, offline. They are also uh, difficult in physical environment. I mean, we know all about the discussion on uh, um, uh, constructive align alignment and also about uh, how difficult it is for teachers to uh, uh, value and recognize teamwork and an end. And I probably to add just another dimension, the social experience, obviously very difficult online, but uh, it also made us realize that we relied basically on structures and actors on campus, which were not always fully recognized, yeah, be it the role of student unions there in this or student clubs. Um, but also on, I, I would just say infrastructure, you know, the triviality that people can go into the canteen, which is a place for very informal information and knowledge sharing, yeah, which is, of course, missing online. But is there also, does that also provide some pointers on how to use them better uh, in, in the real physical environment? The point that uh, Jerome and also uh, Joe made about uh, uh, research and somebody asked the question in the chat actually is academic research recognized is this something where we should which we should use better I mean there's a lot of academic research done and on the other hand we do this more practice oriented research is there a gap to be matched during these two and uh, probably another one that I have then uh, which is about what Jerome just said we fiddled around with the technology when we went into the um, lockdown and by now we know how to use teams and zooms but is that really what we need um i listened last week to our 
the manager or technical director of a big uh, car company who hailed Microsoft, who said, this is fantastic. I never heard anybody from education saying anything positive about Microsoft. And then I suddenly realized that we just get the breadcrumbs, isn't it? I mean, we just get what uh, big tech companies produce for the needs of big industries, but uh, not, not who is producing for us probably. So there wasn't so much need so far, but this has been changing. So is that something that we have to take up? Also to avoid what Joe uh, highlighted or what the paper highlighted about uh, to, make, to ensure that this will still be interoperability, interoperable. I mean, there's a lot of small tech companies coming up now, but if we all sign up with these different companies, we risk uh, that risks uh, some um, yeah, um, disconnect and fragmentation. Yeah. Uh, would anybody like from the panel like to comment on the issue of Microsoft? Yeah, maybe. Sure. Uh, uh, Brina, no, uh, you wanted to start? No, I started earlier, so oh, you go ahead. Okay, you're in, and then maybe Ruta, and then Bruno. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I, I think some very good questions from Michael. I'll, I'll capture some of them, actually. First is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the, the technological need. I think that's that's an interesting one. Um, it, it should be go further than, I think, uh, just being able to 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 deal with Zoom in, in a way, yeah? because it's uh, it was a prerequisite, actually, for us to do video conferencing. But it should, uh, if we really want to take it seriously, we should take it a step further. But also not being, I think, Led by only by what was what what are the developments from text, but working together. I think personally, we want to to build a very good virtual campus in a way that would uh, be a prerequisite. I think for for good international collaboration, and there we could, would certainly need the help with um, I think from tech, but in a joint uh, uh, and I think in a, in a joint uh, environment and not actually yeah. seeing okay what did they develop and how can we use it now. Yeah. We we should engage with um, with with the tech companies there to build something really. Based on collaboration, I think that, that that would be a very important one. About the, the research, I think the, the, Joe also alluded on that. There can be a kind of a gap, I think, between your research world and your teaching world. I also experienced uh, that. Uh, what we try to do in Maastricht University is a kind of uh, actually also to stimulate teachers to do research and uh, to do educational research, which is in itself not that simple. I'm more, in, let's say, a medical researcher in a way, and I also didn't find it simple. But it actually to, to give teaching or teacher uh, and inspire research also the place it deserves, also as a part of, of recognition and reward from an academic career. I think that would be a very important one. And I think lastly, I think the, the, about the, uh, the assessment, I think the standard way of assessments, we had to do it partly by proctoring, which is not a very good or, or stimulating tool at all. So what we learned from that, and we already had um, um, experience on that, for instance, in the field of medicine, we really want to move to programmatic assessment, in which you get a more, I think, holistic view of what uh, different competencies of the, of the students. And we would probably not try to repeat in the end if, let's say, we would be in the same environment again, going back to proctoring, because this is not, an, uh, I think, to personally not a way to go for the, for the future and doesn't give real yeah, the value to the assessment in, in, the, in the way what we'd like to achieve in problem-based learning. I think this far would be my comments. You ask probably more, but I would also like to give my colleagues a chance to reflect on that. Thank you, Ruta. In a few comments also, we spoke about internationalization actually of, of uh, study programs and, and courses. And I think digital learning and uh, internationalization in terms of now European university alliances, one big advantage in my opinion is uh, building student networks. Because I really sure that uh, internationalization on research level, on the level of cooperation between researchers and teachers, it functions very well. But actually we, what we need much more is the cooperation between students, regional, not only on the European level, but also regional uh, cooperation, regional student networks, uh, Later, they may become also professional networks, but uh, we should start already in academia at the university building such networks. And I think European University Initiative is a very good instrument for that. 
And uh, so uh, also our responsibility, of course, especially in the field of humanities for our, our own, uh, own society. And there are so many important issues that we uh, have to discuss, like dealing with our cultural memory and so on, or maybe appropriation of public spaces, urban spaces. But of course, for students, it's much more motivating if they do it also in, in regional networks, in, in international networks. And I think it's also, of course, when we speak about assessment, the teamwork, challenge or problem or based project they are always much more difficult to assess but uh, but i think we, we we should do that and we should encourage uh, such that our students enter dif different communities and generates implements uh, ideas together with uh, like-minded friends uh, and uh, uh, i think it's important that do they do that voluntarily so that they have this freedom of choice. And uh, so also with professionals outside the, the, the university. So I think it's really, uh, it's the best education for responsible citizens and this voluntary and the freedom of choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruta. And Binar, just uh, one, one minute, I'm afraid, because we're getting towards the end. Okay, uh, technically what we need is tool to um, implement de debate, oh, that students can debate one together, whiteboard and so on. So that's what we need. About assessment, uh, some of my colleagues asked me, what can I do to avoid cheating? And so we organized what we call Google proof session, just, just to, to have an example, Google proof. And, but what is interesting in this process is that, in fact, Google proof concentrate on competencies. And so we come back to, to, the, assess to, the, to, to the constructive alignment. So maybe you can f focus on uh, competencies than on, on knowledge. And uh, connection with the research, evidence-based education. This means to use the same principle as in, in research. So first you start to, when you want to innovate, you see what is in the literature. Then you innovate, you measure what you have done and you communicate, so you, you publish yourself on, on your experiment. One minute. Very good, wonderful, uh, um, Joe. Do you have any any reflections on on the rich uh, arsenal of points that have been made? Uh, so so much, and it's it's um, uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, I'll just sort of keep it like Benoit, uh, sort of trying to be very short. Uh, we clearly uh, we face the same challenges. Uh, we've connected and used the good experience we had in the sector, and we we the. the the pandemic has actually also provided us uh, so much that we've learned. Um, in terms of the assessment that Venua has touched upon, uh, there is so much good work uh, on sort of, again, uh, Michael was sort of met, uh, touched upon it. We've been discussing about the sort of constructive alignment and this sort of opportunity now to shift from the sort of cheating and catching to a much more constructive, much more revisiting uh, how in this sort of world that, uh, as Ruta was saying, we want students to dynamically apply their learning and we want active citizens, we want uh, students who will take ownership of their learning and will be able to actually create their path uh, and, and, and through that to benefit from mobilities, from connectedness, uh, from all the good that transnational collaboration can offer. Uh, but we know that this is easier said than done. And, and, and we had uh, a lot that we've learned over the past 14, 14 months. Um, there was a very good uh, discussion that also Susan asked a question about, uh, we're talking about research-led teaching, uh, very rarely do we talk about teaching-led research. And, and I, I very much is something that I really, uh, goes back to uh, issues that I have very very close to my heart that we don't perpetuate bound binaries and boundaries between separating where we talk and how we talk about research and where we talk about teaching. We need to do it for the purposes that we are actually connecting, learning, improving. But fundamentally, I think what what I'm 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 hearing from from what our discussions and and all the work that we've been doing is that our collective goal is to create those dynamic learning communities 
where, uh, of course, research comes from co-creating teaching, from coming together, and teaching follows joint research, and the two are integrated, and, and also uh, in the life of a, a university, which is a very complex ecosystem, and my, Michael was saying earlier that it's not only about those sort of career paths, but all sorts of other opportunities to engaging with stakeholders outside the academy and so on. Um, so I think I've just gone to close because I ended up being more than one minute, of course. Uh, so um, we are in a transition, we hope we are in a transition period. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, one of the colleagues said that soon we would be back um, with our students, uh, back to our campuses and so on. But we are in a transition period anyway. So this discussion is really timely. And uh, let's, let's continue. I, I feel that there is so much that we can do by joining our collective power. So I really hope that uh, we will be able to, to, to use what we're starting, to use the seminars, to use those opportunities uh, to really bring collective change. So thank you, Jan, back to you. So um, I just... Um, I just really want to then then uh, take this opportunity to just thank all the panelists, thank the thank the participants. Um, what we've uh, seen, I think, really in this panel is just simply how um, exciting teaching innovation is, and I think all the speakers have spoken with real passion and persuasion about the space. and 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 I think that's the first ex really important uh, take home message and that when we when we convert that excitement into our classrooms and into our examinations then of course it's also extremely important that that is evaluated in our careers and that this is valued um, in in new ways and I think that we there is there is an insistence that we need to bring uh, clearly to our institutions um, uh, about this point um, I think another really important point has been about the importance of evidence evidence uh, that we need to take both in terms of from from the research on on pedagogy into the classroom but also then back um, uh, and I think one of the things that's, that's really um, combined all these uh, contributions in my mind has been the insistence really on active uh, learning and how and, and really encouraging the students um, in new ways to reflect on their learning and that is a really interesting and important space to bring in bring together so many of the things that we sometimes think of as binary you know the regional the international for instance or the the uh, the digital and 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 the uh, and the physical uh, aspects of learning um i can't possibly do justice to all the many points that have been uh, raised here we um i do think it's uh, it, it there is something that really connects the second this the second part of this discussion to the policy um, agenda, not just because a lot of these issues are, of course, discussed uh, right now in, at a European uh, and, and also at a national uh, level. Um, but again, I think it's really important to insist that um, also at the policy level, um, when, we, when we talk about the strategy for, European, uh, for, for universities, when we think about U uh, the European university alliances, um, that we put the bottom-up concerns of our, our, our teachers as well as of our research as that we really put that into the heart of these endeavors and they, they are not uh, top-down initiatives um, and and that uh, then that therefore I think we all uh, can can once again fully welcome the co-creational aspects um, of, of these initiatives and it's important that that strategy will take some time to to be uh, formulated. Um, I want to really thank all the speakers for their contributions, um, the, the, the different institutions that they represent. I think it's wonderful that we can um, think together in these ways, and I hope that we can continue these conversations also in other contexts. And I really want to um, uh, finish with the um, question uh, that uh, from Katja Bröger, which unfortunately we haven't been able to uh, respond to given the time pressures. It's a hugely important question about the uh, what, what it is that we're doing as public institutions relying on these, these private providers very much, Michael, going back to your, your point about uh, Zoom and Microsoft, also going back very much to uh, Vanessa de bien um early invitation to us to re reflect on where the added value of Europe could be in, in this space. Um, and that leads me straight to our next event on the 29th of uh, June, which uh, will uh, feature really um, uh, representatives from uh, DG Employment, 
uh, from DG ERC, uh, from the FutureLearn platform, so EdTech, um, but it also will have representatives of three different university alliances, uh, Utopia, Enlight, and ECIU. And it's really focusing very much on, on microcredits, uh, but also on how we engage with, with uh, technology. Uh, um, and it really gives us a chance, and, and as all these other events will do, uh, to delve deeper into the issues that we've raised today. And with that, I really want to thank you, thank our audience, and uh, Katya, I'm sorry to, 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 to leave you with this cliffhanger to this, uh, but, if you, but I hope that we, you and others uh, will reconnect with us on the 29th of uh, June. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Joe, for, the, for a fantastic paper, and we look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.